Uh, so welcome. We're going to give you an idea about uh, engineering at Maryland and specifically about material science and engineering. Uh, I'm Tim Fakey. My background is mechanical properties of materials and failure analysis, accident investigations. I teach uh, several classes on the engineering side of material science and engineering. Um, so how to select materials for your um, application, mechanical properties, things like that. So um, let's go ahead and do this. Whoops. Advancing is a little enthusiastic. Go back. There we go. So University of Maryland is located up here in College Park, in, just inside the Beltway. Um, so transportation is actually quite convenient. BWI has uh, flights just about everywhere. We have Dulles. We have uh, National Airport down here. Um, so getting in and out is quite easy. There's lots of opportunities if you're looking for recreation and so forth. Uh, in DC, nearby Baltimore, the ocean's not too terribly far away. So it's, uh, it's a nice location. It's also amongst an awful lot of companies and government organizations that uh, you might have an opportunity to uh, interface with if you are an undergraduate here. And I'll go into that a little bit more later. Um, the school itself is the A. James Clark School of Engineering. There, uh, it's inside the University of Maryland. Uh, it's a medium to large university, um, nice campus. Uh, the school undergraduates for uh, engineering numbers are last year, but 4,300 undergrads. Um, there's eight departments. Material science and engineering is one. We're the second smallest department. Uh, fire protection is smaller. And uh, we have a nicely rated program. Uh, these numbers are actually one year old, and we've moved up a little bit since then in terms of uh, the outside world's regard for our program and uh, how well our students do and so forth out in the real world. Um, as with many universities, but in particular here, we're building a, a lot. Um, we have a new computer science center, the Arrivi Center. This is being constructed, the Idea Factory, which is for um, to foster startups that students and faculty um, come up with ideas Tech, new technologies and to launch them out into the world. We're getting a large uh, engineering uh, building to coalesce some uh, departments together and try and uh, facilitate uh, interactions a little bit better. But in particular for you, the new Clark building, um, A. James Clark was an alumni who passed away a, few, a couple of years ago and left quite a bit of money to the university. And uh, before he passed away, he actually funded this building. What's of consequence to undergraduates and to freshmen is down here in the first couple of levels, it's all dedicated to um, maker spaces, workspaces, collaboration spaces that is all for undergraduates. So there's a full machine shop, there's lots of tables where you can get together and smash ideas around. They have uh, classes, have labs in there. Um, so the bottom two floors are all student maker space where you're going to get your hands on things early and often, which uh, was is a change from when I was an undergraduate. Um, my, my applied stuff was a little bit lacking. It's nice that they're fostering that because it makes things more real, less abstract. You're gonna take a lot of abstract courses to start with in chemistry and physics, but to get your hands dirty early on, that's why you wanna become an engineer. You like to do stuff. Um, there's been a number of very successful alumni, uh, as I mentioned, um, Mr. Clark, but astronauts, Sirius Radio, fiber optic communications, biomedical devices, Fortnite. Um, lots of things have come out of the Clark School in terms of innovative ideas, technologies that have been turned into stuff. And these alumni have all then fed back to the university, give back to foster you guys, the next generation. So Dr. Clark, or Mr. Clark got um, scholarship to attend university. And that's really the only way he could have attended school. And now he's paying that back after he's become so, he was so successful in um, lots of money for scholarships for the next generation and the following generation, especially underprivileged and underserved areas. So what is material science and engineering? You notice it's got the combination name, material science and engineering. And it's one of the few STEM, science, technology, and engineering, mathematics um, programs that is both. The material science part is figuring out 
how do things work? How do you make it better? How do you make it smaller? How do you discover new materials with new useful properties? And the materials engineering is take those discoveries and turn them into really cool devices or improve existing devices. So it's very much both. You have to understand the science in order to be able to do the engineering. I need to know how if I cut something or weld something or mix something or heat something, I've changed the properties that I want to use in my device. So what we use to describe material science and engineering is this triangle of processing, structure, and properties. So every thing, as it says there, everything's made of stuff. If you think about it, history has been determined by stuff, and particularly by new stuff. Every time a new material is discovered, it opens up all kinds of new applications and new kinds of technology. When they first discovered that silicon was a transistor, or could be made into a transistor, a solid state switch, a very, 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 very fast switch. Once you have a switch on, off, one, zero, you can do binary, you can do calculations. So they discovered that on the science side, physics and material science. And on the engineering side, how do you make it really small? How do you make it even faster? How do you make it more versatile? And that's working with electrical engineers and other people with material science in order to make the application better, okay? So every material has a composition, a chemical composition. And inside of this <clears throat> composition, there's a bubble of properties. So it could be strength, it could be microelectronic properties, it could be magnetic properties. And inside that bubble with processing, you can change which property you have and what the value is. So the processing gives you some sort of a structure inside of the material, crystals, amorphous, layers, whatever. That structure gives you the properties. And if the properties aren't good enough, you go back and you change the processing to do it again. And you go around and around, and this is called the materials optimization loop. You work with chemistry, processing, which is heat it and beat it, if you want to be really fundamental about it. And then you measure, what can this do? And then once I know what this can do, I can make something out of it. Okay, so there's different classes of materials, metals, ceramics and glasses, which include things like bathroom tile, but also really sophisticated cutting tools, also microelectronic devices and other solar cells. There's polymers, which range from very chemically inert to very, very strong, very, very cheap. There's obvious uh, problems these days with uh, recycling and so forth. Lots of work to be done in making re more recyclable polymers. Then you take these and you put them together and you make composites. So for fiber, carbon fiber composite, I have carbon fiber, very strong, very brittle. I have polymer resin, fairly strong, quite brittle. I put them together and I get something that's strong and tough and I can tailor the properties by how I arrange the fibers. You open up another space. Hey, I've got something light, strong, and practically indestructible. What can I do with it? Aerospace, sporting goods, what have you. Um, a lot of natural materials are natural composites. Wood, this is, these are silk, um, all of which have evolved over time to optimize their properties for their particular application. And we learn a lot from natural materials in terms of what structures work and what materials um, is there anything that we can mimic nature like silk, which is amongst the strongest, lightest materials out there? Can we make our own version of silk? And then there's all kinds of things that I call the weirdos. So this is um, a spreader. It's to move your teeth out sideways and widen your jaw. Um, the, the things inside of here are actually made out of what's called shape memory alloy, which if you deform it cold to a certain shape and you warm it up, it wants to go back to its original shape, so it'll, it'll naturally spread it apart without having to use any kind of adjustments. So lots of different categories of materials that you might find interest in, you're gonna learn about. I like looking at materials over history. The ages of man are named after materials, stone, copper, bronze, iron, or we could be now in the silicon age or the polymer age or what have you. But way back when, they were using all kinds of natural materials. So this is a plot of strength and weight. So this is heavy, this is light, this is weak, this is strong. So if you want strong and light, you wanna be up here. This is the magic corner. Excuse me, way back when, 
all natural materials. It's been argued that the advent of pot, being able to make pottery, so making a new material out of clay and sand, actually helped move forward uh, human civilization because people were able to, for the first time, store crops and store other things, keep them away from the animals so that they could produce lots of food and, and, and have it safe. So now they got stuff they can start trading and so forth. So just the advent of a new material supposedly triggered a whole new kind of civilization. And at the time, all they had for metals was gold. Gold is the only metal that exists as a pure metal or as a, as a metal metal and not as an ore because it doesn't react with anything. And if you go through time, when you go into the Roman times, now we're in the Bronze Age. You've got the metals in copper, lead, tin, that, oh, my headphone thing just cut out on me. Hold on. Metals that can be smelted from an ore in a campfire. And as furnaces got hotter and hotter, and pottery kilns got hotter and hotter, they started being able to smelt higher temperature materials. So they got more things to work with. The Romans invented concrete, which was rediscovered 16, 1700 years later. Um, and then I find it interesting that in the 1500 years of the dark ages, they basically were able to invent or discover one material, cast iron. Um, but there was no need to invent new materials. During the dark ages and during the early Renaissance, they were happy with what they had. But then during the Renaissance, they started thinking, well, what can we do that's new? And you get up around 1900, now we have aluminum. We have the first polymers, natural rubbers, that were, they were able to turn into things. You're starting to get a little bit more space. And then World War II, boy, was there a need for new materials. They needed to make jet engines. They needed to replace materials they could no longer get because of the war. So there's a lot and titanium and oh my headphones doing that again but we also start to get the first the first ones that aren't natural rubber is a natural polymer but we also have a lot of now artificial polymers coming in and then today boom new metals high temperature high hardness ceramics composite cfrp is carbon fiber reinforced polymer way more polymers. And now we start getting into things like foams, which is a composite, but it's a composite of polymer and air. And it has its own properties. So you see how the space has just exploded in the last 60, 70, 80 years. So this, these are the topics that the National Academy of Science has identified as grand challenges for engineering. And all the ones in green involve materials. Make solar energy economical. Okay, first, let's make solar cells more efficient. Let's make them more reliable. Let's make them cheaper to manufacture. Once you generate the electricity, a lot of the solar fields are not where the people are. So you need to store the power for when the sun doesn't shine. That's battery technology. There's a lot of materials, finding the right materials for batteries to make them reliable. You have to transmit the electricity. Conductors, transformers, all of which depend on material properties. Fusion, you're talking about high temperature materials that can contain fusion inside of a magnetic field. Carbon sequestration is going to involve materials. So you know about a catalytic converter in a car where it converts smog to less dangerous gases by running it over a mesh of platinum palladium metal. When the molecules hit the surface, it's called catalysis and it causes reactions to occur. Well, you can imagine maybe they can come up with a catalyst that can change carbon dioxide into something that we can capture. There was a, uh, a capstone project done by our undergraduates this last spring, where they had designed a device that will turn CO2 in uh, stacks at power plants into methane that can then be captured and used in other things like fuel cells, okay? Clean water, filtration, materials. You have to have a filter for materials. Restore and improve the urban infrastructure, more reliable concrete, better rebar, better ways to predict the properties of these things, and so on and so on. Nuclear terror, better sensors so that you can detect problems. The tools, engineer the tools of scientific discovery, sensors, sensors, you need something that reacts to something else in order to tell what, what's going on. So you need materials in all of these things in order to move forward. 
So our program is about 3,500, or 35 undergraduates per year. So that would be your class moving through and the, the total population four years, about 140. We have a pretty low student faculty ratio. One of the things about this department is the faculty is very hands-on. There are other departments of the university where uh, your advisor will never learn your name. Well, here your advisor certainly knows who you are and helps you through the process to get to where you want to go, both academically and professionally. We have a mentoring program where from time to time you sit down with a different faculty and find out what is grad school about? What is working for the government about? What's it like working for a company? And basically help you answer the question that I hope people have been asking you before now, what do you want to do with the rest of your life? And how are you going to get there? We have lots of opportunities for co-ops and research with faculty. And the students hand these jobs off from one to the next year over year. You will, you will learn and you will meet the people in the years before you, and you will help the people in the years after you. It's a community inside of this department. It's a very diverse community as well. Some departments in engineering are overwhelmingly male and white, not, not this department. It is extraordinarily diverse. There are lots of institutions that our students go and do research at. I used to work at the National Institutes of Standard Technology up here in Gaithersburg, but um, there are lots of government agencies. There are nonprofits um, with a range of of different topics, Food and Drug Administration, NASA. Uh, we had someone work at the National Transportation Safety Board to help investigate accidents. So there's lots of opportunities in a very small volume and there's a good metro system that can help you get there. So what are you going to study? Pro Professor Lloyd's gonna talk a little bit about the program as well. But in the first year or two, what you are taking are the underpinning classes. One of the things about material science and engineering that I tell my students and I have them tell me after they've been out in the working in the field, oh, you were absolutely right. Material science and engineers tend to be the Rosetta Stone of engineering. Chemists and chemical engineers just can't seem to talk to mechanical engineers. They don't share a vocabulary. But you will be taking classes in all of these fields so that you can make a connection with all of these disparate fields. And I, I've had students come back and tell me, oh my God, I was just in a meeting and so-and-so said something and like he could have been talking Swahili and she was talking Romanian and they did not, they were just talking past each other. Whereas I could help them understand what was going on. Uh, one of the classes you're gonna take in particular is engineering design where they drop you in right away on an engineering project. You make a autonomous robot that has to do a, a, a project. You're in a team of eight and the journey is as or more important than the results. You will learn how, what it's like to work on a team and how to break down a problem and how to troubleshoot when everything goes wrong. It's a, it's a nice way to get you immersed in it and it lets you know this is what engineering is about. Figure it out. And then later on, you're going to take some intro to material science and engineering, but then you have a number of required courses and electives that allow you to not only become a materials engineer and scientist, but also to pick your specialization, soft materials, energy materials, app materials for application. So you can choose what you would like to specialize in. So there's more information on the website here that gives you what you're going to be looking, experiencing, what to expect, and then also some testimonials about what other students have done. You get into the lab, so this is the lab where you do mechanical uh, mechanical testing with my class, but there's a bunch of other things, uh, metallography, imaging. Uh, but then there's also, this is a lab that is, is very popular with students, the fab lab. You're gonna go in, you're gonna put on the bunny suits, and you're going to design, print, and make integrated circuits, hands on. And this is um, a facility that is set up for not only using it for research for grad students, but it's also dedicated for undergrad teaching. And, Students year after year comment on that they really enjoyed that laboratory. So there is a 3D, um, let's see, is this, there we go. So there's 3D printing for all your students. When you take that intro to engineering class, you 3D print a lot of parts. You design them and you print them out in polymer uh, for your little autonomous robot. Um, so it's, the facility is called Terrapin Works. And there's equipment all over campus that you can log into and print stuff out. Um, 
There's a course added to manufacturing for materials that you can take as an elective in our class. And there's a little video here that I hope this broadcast uh, that you can hear it. Um, but this is showing about additive manufacturing. So right now we're in a building called the Technology Advancement Program building. In this building we have three major labs. We have the MakerBot Innovation Center in here with our 50 3D printers that any student in the university can use. Next door to that we have the Rapid Prototyping Lab and in there we have more industrial 3D printers. We have a Fortis 400 and an Object 30 and it lets you produce visually accurate parts that you can show to people as display pieces and investors. And then in the next room we have some Something called the startup shell and that's basically an incubator where we will go in and we'll help them with their projects so that they can use these labs and the other resources on campus to develop their startup and turn it into a viable business they manage how it operates and surprisingly there are over maybe 50 startup ideas or firms that have come out of that already in three years what we've been trying to do is build that ecosystem of making so that you can use it and execute it in a real system a lot of the prototyping that I would do before this would be with wood. So I'd you know, spend several hours, make sure this is exactly the size that I want, and there's no way that the design that I made before is going to look anything like it. And now it's in the CAD software. I know exactly where that change needs to be. I make that change, and now I have a new product. And it just allows me to fully test the full cycle of my design. I actually just thought of, I have a, I have a print that I started from Seattle. <laughs> And then we came back and it was sitting here in a bag for me. And so just having the ability to do that is, is kind of incredible because we were on the other side of the country and we could start a print. Part of the mantra of University of Maryland is to have innovation and creativity come from anywhere and to have maybe a student from architecture or a student from English who has a great idea, realize their idea and maybe create a startup. It doesn't have to be an engineering student. You know, students today are thinking about, could they be the next Google? Could they be the next Facebook? It's good to have that dream, and we want to allow them to dream more. And it's going to be because they had the MakerBot Innovation Center. We just are giving them the tools to be successful. Okay. So, um, we have at the end of the year, or sorry, the end of your term, during your senior year, you do what's called a capstone, des capstone design project where you form a team and come up with an idea to develop a new technology, make a new technology better, something. And this is where that, uh, that carbon capture thing came from. That idea is actually uh, two of the students went on to work at the advanced physics laboratory at Johns Hopkins and they pitched the idea to their bosses there and they got seed money and they're starting to develop it and perhaps will commercialize it. But a wide range of different projects. And if you go to the website again, undergraduate to Capstone, you can see um, a lot of these, uh, the write-ups of a lot of these projects. Um, so they have won competitions, uh, stretchable silicon photovoltaics, body armor. Uh, these teams have submitted these things to various organizations and have won. And so being recognized that, yeah, they've got some really good ideas and they develop them well enough to be able to take them forward. Students would also do research for, you know, uh, for not only the local area, you can find co-ops and whatnot, but a lot of, of the students do research with local faculty. Again, lots and lots of different ideas funded by lots and lots of different outfits. And students just, again, work one after another, handing off the job, um, and they pitch in for real. They don't just sit there and sweep the floor and mop and you know, wipe the, can can uh, the counters and uh, clean beakers. They're actually doing real substantive work, gaining skills, authoring papers. So we have some faculty doing some really interesting work. Uh, Professor Hu is working on making wood transparent amongst a bunch of other things. Um, energy is really big in the department, things having to do with energy innovation, energy conservation, delivery. Professor Waxman is making a fuel cell <clears throat> more and more efficient. So the, the methane from converting CO2 could be used in a fuel cell and burn to make electricity. It makes water and CO2. You could then reprocess that back to methane. Is that viable? I don't know, but there's a lot of materials involved in making that happen. So once you graduate, what are your prospects? Our students work at a lot of different places. Uh, quite a few of them go on to grad school, but there's a lot of uh, companies, government agencies, NGOs, um, where students are wind up employed. 
Um, you can stay local. You can find someplace across the country. I have students that keep in touch with me from five and 10 years ago who are scattered around the world. I had one who desperately wanted to work in construction in wild remote places. He's working for Bechtel right now. He's in Russia. Um, in material science and engineering, about half of our students go to grad school, but the rest find jobs with good companies, government agencies doing interesting stuff. And um, the placement um, in the last couple of years in particular, students are just, they're saying multiple offers. They haven't any trouble finding jobs and the salaries aren't bad. So I wanna talk about one thing, the last thing real quick. Um, there's also fun and team building stuff that goes on. There's a, a, what's called the Alumni Cup in the Clark School where every department puts together a team to make a Rube Goldberg machine, which is do something simple in the stupidest, most complicated way you can find. So what they had to do is make a way to dunk this basketball using a complicated system of 25 complications, but they all had to do with your major. So all of these have something to do with material science. And this is our team that put it together. They worked very hard. They were the only one to have a perfect run this last go where, where they made it all the way to the end without having to poke it. And the winner, they won the competition. This is the, the size of our team. And you can see diversity incarnate. Um, but this is the kind of camaraderie and team building and, and friendships that you find in a smaller department. You, you know everybody inside the department versus mechanical where your class might have 400 students. So here's an overview. I hope it was informative. I certainly hope you have some questions, but um, consider coming to Maryland, becoming a TERP and joining us in the material science department.